So when COVID hit, I had, you know, Marcus, I do lessons over there and well, we got to do something. I wasn't even allowed in the school. So, well, let's just, you know, these guys, I've taught them for three and a half years or more, or whatever. So they know my shtick, but let's just check the box. Let's just take them through the 44 modern rudiments online workout by workout on the site. And then, oh my gosh, they apparently did not know my shtick because there was a bell curve in the improvement of their hands and the absolute purity and flow of the strokes, sound quality, speed, the whole thing. So yeah, and a couple of those top kids ended up marching Santa Clara. And there, there's a bunch of people like top flight players who've, you know, they have already got Sanfords and yet they go and subscribe to drumworkout.com. And, you know, I got a kid who just keeps looping through the extreme hands makeover. And it's like every, it's like layers of an onion. Every time you go back, it's like, oh, like that's the next level of that's how that feels. And, you know, it's, it's fundamentals. It all, everything comes back to fundamentals. Yeah, it's really cool that you can loop back around like, uh, like a gym membership or working out and just uh, keep, keep going back and getting better. Uh, so do you have any one-liner advice for band directors? That's a hard one. One is let the stick breathe. So when you're like, when I'm doing this, there's you know, a whole checklist of things that need to be just right. That one wasn't just right, but I'm still learning how to play with his hand. So, but when you're dealing with young people, you know, the bar is going to be a little lower, just be realistic, but get them bouncing the stick. Just don't hold, because if you hold, it's like you're trying to learn how to drive the car, but your left foot's sitting on the brake the whole time. You'll be endlessly pushing against the brick wall. So get, let the stick rebound, let it flow. And uh, yeah, that's the biggest thing. So a lot of people are all about, well, we got to get them on keyboards. And one thing Kenan does with the sixth graders, like the whole first semester, all you do is you drum, you hit stuff on the pad. And then we'll go to a keyboard because if, if these mechanics are not working, you know, who cares about the sharps and flats? You know, it's all going to be a tight, dysfunctional thing anyway. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of different ways to teach, but that's the way I like to do it too. For at least the first month or so, we're we're just on pads. Um, because I, like you said, if you can't turn your wrist, I don't think it matters. Uh, something I think is a little bit worse is um making a percussionist start on a wind instrument for the whole first year what do you think about that i don't know it, it seems kind of unnecessary but i guess it is a chance like here they had four instruments you could pick from and then you could audition for percussion aside from that yeah i don't know i i guess it gives them a chance to get to know the kids and their rhythmic potential and whatnot but it also simplifies things fewer instruments and yeah that. it seems unfair to me yeah and it's not fair being a percussionist either because there's such a ridiculously wide range of instruments and you know as if we're all going to be so great at all of these things yeah yeah and hey so as somebody who went to unt and berkeley um did you ever find it strange that there's not really a progressive rock drum set track or a country or just a drum set track it has to be you're a jazz major or you play orchestral percussion and maybe you'll learn some drum set Do, did that ever strike you as weird yeah i think some of that is percussive snootiness sometimes you know some people are like marimba is like the highest elevation of percussion it's like mm -hmm. it's awesome there's <laughs> no question there but yeah, everything is going to be as hard as you want it to be as far as you're going to take it. But yeah, you have to be realistic. At some point, you're going to end up better at one thing and another. And a lot of it is just follow, you know, following your passions. I mean, I would be a hockey player before a marimbist. That's just my nature. I love the aggression and physicality that the drums bring. You know, I, I when I played in college, like I would love playing marimba for 15 minutes and then I would, <laughs> I would start to fry out 
and just kind of my personality you know like the thing i i played drums because first of all it looked easy when i was in fourth grade i learned mm -hmm. but then watching phil collins with old genesis go ballistic and then neil Peart, like there's this athletic awesomeness about it like that's what i signed up for and and there's nothing wrong with that when you no. when you find an art that moves you run with it so i i think it's poor when when some teacher is going to their snobbery of you got to be able to play everything great and you're crushing some kid who just loves a snare drum and wants to have a blast playing snare drum that's not broken there's nothing wrong with that you know he's going to be living in the band room with his people drumming and having a good time so why dissuade him you know if it's your mission to become a well-rounded everything then great but you know yeah. don't, don't poo poo on other people's their goals there i haven't really touched marimba since college but i'm a musician i have a good ear you know, I'll call out a sus four chord. You know, I like the flat two there. I know things. I've forgotten more theory than most people have learned, but I'm not one to pick up mallets and do much. And that's okay. I've been making a living with these things and it ain't broke. It, it's just, it always struck a chord with me that like, well, you can be a drummer or you can be a musician. Wouldn't you rather be a musician? It's like, well, like, dude, I'm pretty sure Max Roach was a musician. That, dude, that's funny. Because I similarly, I was around, you know, this guy's just, just a drummer. And I wanted to be like, yeah, Steve Gadd is pathetic. Like, oh, <laughs> that, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. <laughs> Korea called Steve Gadd the best musician he's ever played with. It's like, and I don't mean drummer, I mean musician. Yeah. <laughs> that, man, that is an area where people don't know what they don't know. Because I, yeah. I play drum set a lot. And you have to be the alpha you're driving the bus. It's like, hey, go ahead and relax, sit down, shut up, I got you. You know, and like you have to have that alpha personality. And a lot of people will look at the beats and they can play it and they think, oh, that's it. But most people don't know that they can't play a solid two and four groove that sits beautifully in the pocket, right? Or they don't have that absolute sense of ownership where I'm controlling the band. I mean, the power you have as a drummer you can grab the horse by the neck and make it drink you know dynamically like you can set everything up and yeah it's really cool what you can do with that instrument there's a lot more to it than people realize i wonder what you think of this phrase drummers don't play time they play patterns you know that's interesting because i've been playing with a church group doing sort of mission stuff where we don't have the click and the babysitter incident you know in ears basically for those of you who don't know because i have one foot in scholastic percussive pedagogy world and the other in just drum set dude world and a lot of people don't realize that when they see a band play nowadays there's almost always in ears with a click and a guide so, you know i love the babysitter man <laughs> it takes the pressure off and so all that stuff is going on so we've been doing some stuff without the, the babysitter and click. And some people are like, well, you know, Bill's the metronome. Like, no, I, I'm the unifier. You know, yeah. I'm going to make it. So if, if you, I mean, vocalists are going to rush and do all kinds of kooky stuff, especially. And so I'm going to split the difference. If I'm a stubborn traffic cop, I'm just a deaf jerk. And the whole thing feels terrible. So I'm in charge of the feel and the unity and i'm good with things drifting you know keep keep your ears on because if i some people do it where the drummer is the only one with the metronome in their ears and that is painful to listen to so unless the whole entire band has great ears and they're completely subservient to the drummer it's going to sound awful mm -hmm. and the funny thing is from an audience perspective the melody is always right. So the drummer is the one who sounds like deaf and can't groove at all. So it's kind of like, yeah, if you have to be a traffic cop, the whole thing's just going to be terrible. Just like ensemble technique, and most people don't understand it. They don't know that they don't understand it. Same thing with listening, which goes mm -hmm. back to like the DCI level ears and that tolerance of right on. 
they don't know that they can't listen that well. I talk about people's great ears. I mean, the best musicians are the ones with the best ears. And if you listen well, you will be incredibly comfortable to play with and people will love you and they'll call you again and again and again. So, which is, you know, back to time and the metronome, I tell people the metronome is not your timekeeper, it is your ear trainer. As tight as you play with that metronome is as tight as you will play with another musician, even while time naturally fluctuates a little bit. So it drives me nuts if people aren't just nails on the click because let's just get rid of it. If you're gonna ignore it and be rude, you know, if you ask the metronome to prom, what would it say? It'd say no, because you're a terrible listener. You know, come on. Yeah, use it. I mean, especially on a pad. You have two sticks and a pad. You know, one, it's a one-dimensional thing. And yet, if you are not burying that click, well, I shouldn't say burying it, because then you can't hear it. If you are not right on with that click, then you're of no use to me. If you can't play with that click, you certainly can't play with another player. So yeah, the metronome is your ear trainer, not your timekeeper. So good time and rhythmic understanding, they're just ancillary benefits of playing with your metronome or a click all the time. All right, so we have a question from Andy K. Does Bill, does Bill still see a place in quad drumming for mallets? And if so, what's his thought process when writing? I haven't used mallets in years. I don't think they sound as good as a good stick. And they don't feel as good, especially on the smaller drums. So, but the advantage is they do tend to get a bigger sound and they're shorter, which is easier to move around with. That said, a lot of people use sticks and the sticks tend to get a small slice of a sound to project. They lose that tenor body and that fullness. So that's where this comes in. So this is the Vic first Bill Bachman signature quad stick. And you mentioned the Billy Club earlier. So that changed. So this is actually a whole new version. They, the idea is I want the stick to work like a mallet instead of getting that thin slice of, you know, piercing to kind of cut through. I want an actual tenor full bodied goodness. So the weight distribution of this gets a lot more of that fullness. So it sounds a lot more like a mallet, but it doesn't have that metallic click on rim shots that you can't hit half the time anyway, because the drums are in the way and it just has the, the feel of a stick. So incidentally, the Billy Club, the old version was really designed for solo stuff. When you're going from drum three to drum four, you know, you're covering almost three feet or whatever in the blink of an eye, any extra link turns into extra weight exponentially. And so the billy club was actually pretty short and stubby. And so the new version is longer and it's thinner, which makes it feel longer. So it's a lot more of a general use stick. So last year, Crown was using it, Pacific Crest used it. This year in Trinity Percussion and a, a bunch of people are using that. So it's, it's got legs that the old one didn't because it's a lot more universal. So answer the question, Obviously, I might be biased, potentially, but this kind of does what most sticks don't. And the design, real quick, it has a giant footprint, so you get the big surface area, and then the hand crossed over gets the same footprint. It has a drop-down, a little notch right there, so that your front fingers can reach further around when it's time for that reefed quick stuff where the fingers really kick in, and it opens up to the back of your hand. And it's just a little heavier down there, so there's more inertia. So I'm playing with velocity, but the construction and weight balance of the stick has more inertia up front. So try them out. If you remember the Billy Club, for better or for worse, forget about it. This is a whole new game. So that's that's why I like it. And I, I think Mallet have they've had their day, but I think the future is here. Somebody A beat them at Infinity. They're playing with normal you know, solid, big Vic snare sticks. And then they, they beat it with this. And even though this is a lighter, smaller stick, it actually sounded bigger and fuller. And so it's like, wow, it's lighter. It's easier to move around with. It's a little bit shorter and it sounds a lot bigger. So the tattered goodness, 
So anyway, I, I kind of think that every household in America should order a few pairs of these. That's my Yeah, favorite. I'm going to check those out. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Are you, besides them using your sticks, are you involved in Infinity in any other way? Because that's like right in my backyard, essentially. Uh, those guys are awesome. That is a great group. I just came down there and did a clinic. And the idea was I was going to go down there a bit more, but it just kind of didn't work out with life and whatnot. But yeah, so I got the sweatshirt and some swag, but that that is a great group of people. I mean, just what an opportunity. And they got three groups. So if you're anywhere near Florida, mm -hmm. my gosh, go down there, get your learn on. It's a fantastic group, very well run. So yeah, it was really cool to uh, freaking weekend and help those guys out. I don't know. I just, I, I think these are the future. I'm, I'm really, really, really happy with these where the old ones, even I was like, they kind of stubby. Yeah. So I, I got to redesign it, which is really, really good. And you know, on snare drum, these things work too. I think that's sort of a, might be an undiscovered thing because, you know, it's like, oh, the snares are so tight and so rickety ticky. The, I miss, I miss the body and the fullness. It's like, these work just as well. They they do amazing things on snare drum. If you want beef out of those drums, these things do it. So don't be afraid to try that out either. Yeah, we'll have to put an order in, man. I'm excited to hear what they sound oh. like. So we had another question that was proper wrist technique to get rid of forearm slash wrist tendonitis. Yeah, that is, I don't believe in tendonitis and carpal tunnel. All these things are easily avoidable. And I've had dozens of people who've come to me with those problems and it's always a technical issue. And if you play the, you know, the right way, quote unquote, you can get around that you can drum full tilt nine hours a day and you don't want to stop, but your hands feel too good at the end of it. So the most common culprit of that is, well, again, German grip, because you're, you're squeezing on either side to maintain this fulcrum while your wrist is going up and down and, uh, you know, playing extra flat to the drum. I mean, if you want to get tendonitis, the best way to do it is German grip, squeezing hard to maintain that gap and play pause rolls with no R, you know, under the stick, flat as you can to the drum. That's the quickest way to get tendonitis. So if you don't, then go American grip and use your hand off thumb on the top side of the stick with never pressure, and it'll make a world of difference. And then let your R be a reliever. So, yeah, it's easily avoidable. It's, it's all technique. Have you ever gotten injured? No. Well, one time I didn't drum for a whole month and I went to a cadets camp and I just played as aggressively as I could and my hands were unhappy with me. But no. But I also, I also played more German with my left hand. And that's why people's left hands are, aren't nearly as good as their right. It's not so much, that they're, it's not that they're right-handed, more people are right-handed. It's not that on drum set, you play more notes with your right hand. It's a little bit of that, but mainly it's the right hand knows French grip on the ride cymbal. And so you end up with not quite maxed grip, where this one has the Gandalf thumb on the top side of the stick, and you shall not pass and to be able to apply downward pressure and facilitate finger control. And the left is functionally in German grip where they're not using the thumb in that capacity. It doesn't mean flat hand way out here. It just means the thumb is not being used for downward pressure and holding the stick down so the fingers can go to town. So that's that's why people's left hands are sad. So, okay, I mentioned the Gandalf thumb. So coming back around to that, basically Gandalf says, you shall not pass and puts a stake in the ground, right? So the Gandalf thumb says, you shall not pass. The stick wants to fly up, but by putting that in front of it, it's a, it's a game changer, right? So it says you shall not pass. So the thumb is in charge of downward pressure, right? And facilitating finger control. So the Gandalf thumb is literally holding the stick down so the fingers can, can go to town. Fingers can go to town, right? So if I play this, the, you can see the stick is pivoting under the thumb. And if I take that thumb away, I'm not even touching this part of my index. Right? So it's, it's holding the stick further down in the hand, giving the fingers better access. And that's what people's right hands have because they know French grip from the right symbol and whatnot because their left hands don't have. And that's why their left hands are sad and tight and slow. So yeah, it's a massive deal. Getting the Gandalf thumb in American grip 
is key. So anytime you want downward pressure or a lot of finger control, that thumb is the answer. And in German grip, you got no access to that. Or the German grip, mm -hmm. not using the thumb in that capacity, your, your progress is stunted. You're pushing against a brick wall. No need for injuries. Well, it is Ring Finger Awareness Month every month. Like, that's one of my texts is like, get that back to finger. <laughs> now that's my left hand. That's the biggest thing that I've done more recently to try to get to the next level with that. This is just more ring finger and pinky awareness. Because for years, I did a lot more short burst where I favored the front fingers in my left hand. And that's my, why my left hand, there are certain things that I just wouldn't want to do. Then my right hand could just fly. And one day I'm realizing, -da 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 -da. oh, the ring finger's driving the bus. And I don't have that same, you know, same sensation there. So yeah, it's all technique. Basically, if you take a stack and you push down, and I just use my index, I have hardly any leverage. This is horrible. The yeah, the middle weight mm -hmm. ring, tons. Pinky, forget about it. So your pinky has the most leverage and power, right? So your pinky is your minimum finesse, maximum power finger. Your index is your maximum finesse, minimum power finger. So as you need, you know, you're playing low, light, fast, intraday finesse, your front two fingers are really going to be taking the job. You're just pinching out stuff. But then whenever you're playing bigger, use the fingers further back as you can. Which brings me to my general algorithm. The wrist can do it. Let the wrist do it. If the wrist would struggle, this is the guy's question too about tendonitis and wrist. If the wrist would struggle, then your fingers come in to bail out the wrist. And they're going to come in from the back to the front in terms of priority. If the whole hand would struggle, then the arm comes in to bail out the hand. So either through a pumping motion or a whipping motion in order to, you know, attain stick height without having to lift the stick. About the logic series. So going back to quad logic, which came out in 97, we're at 25 years now, which is crazy. And then root of metal logic came out basically there are a lot of books of beads, but nothing told you how to do anything. And so that's where that one kind of came in. And then base logic, which, you know, does its thing very well. So I started writing for Modern Drummer some years ago, and I started producing tons of articles and went strategic with it, kind of in the books. So my book form, these books are kind of like cream of the crop of my pretty modern, updated approach to everything. Stick technique is just how to play. And it's got the 12 gateway rudiments in there and tons of chop builders. Really good and techniques are defined. And this one, Rhythm and Chops Builders, is like it says, it, it takes, it goes pretty deep into rhythm, but doesn't get to the ridiculous math test, 13 against nine. It's like stuff you're actually gonna use because nowadays there's tons of five against two, five against three, you add stuff into it. So like, again, if I get hit by a bus, these things are packed full of goodness. So I can't, obviously I'm biased, but I can't recommend them highly enough. So it's modern drummer. Publishing. So as a little appetizer, could you tell us what the 12 gateway rudiments are? Yes. The 12 gateway rudiments are the rudiments that have all the hand motions you'll ever need to play everything under the sun. So, so many people are told, especially drum set players, it's like, oh, well, there's the PAS 40 rudiments. You got to know your rudiments. And, oh, what about, what about the hybrids? It's like, oh crap. I'm, you know, I don't want to deal with this. I'm supposed to learn all this stuff because somehow I turned into something, but I just don't get it. So why are we burdening these people with all this stuff? If you know these 12 gateway rudiments, you'll have all the individual hand motions that are necessary to play anything and everything. So on the top of my head, you have the single stroke roll. So there is your dribbling free stroke. You have your double stroke roll. And here there's actually three hand motions you need to glean from it. There's the free free. Come on, hands. You know, does that second stroke rebound up? Back to the free stroke. The free stroke proves that that second stroke 
if there's enough velocity on the way down, it'll come up. So that eliminates the question much. That's never going to pop up. And it's got to come up on its own. So if I'm playing tight diddles, that's never going to come up. So it leaves you no choice but to play high quality relaxed beats with velocity and fingers and relaxed hands. So that's the first hand motion from the double. The second one is free down. It's kind of like the horse walks, then it trots. So now there's not enough time to proactively push and then, you know, don't bottom out on the palm, but then open up for the next one. Now it's like all your fingers can do is just grab. So that's basically free down, free down, free down, free down. That's your fingers being able to clamp the second one. Then the third gear is the, where you got to relieve the hands by cranking the forearms. So those are the three motions from the double. Now for that triples, that's sort of the alley you boob, wrist finger fingered. You gotta have that. And then both rolls still on motion where you learn how to press and get a good sound. And then I think I might go to paradiddle and we're kind of gleaning the accent tab factor. And then this is this is fun, the flam ones. There are four of them. And that this ties into the four accent tap scenarios. So the first one is the flam. So if we play slow. You know, hurrah, we got bucks down up. We need that. It's good. But the hand motion we're going to take from that is the, the molar whip and flop. I want to call it the whip and flop and drop the name because people just argue about it. I like to sip the terms. So that's the whip and flop. And then the next one is the flam accent. One hand, bit to him. That's your hug dig a dig. So it's an accent tap with the triple beat. And then you have the inverted flam tap, sorry, which is the no chop, flop, and drop, right? You're emulating the accent tap, tap, but there's not enough time to stop it. So when there's less time to stop the stick, stop the stick less. And then the last one is the inverted flam tap. That's the, the molar whip and stop. Got to get this hand warmed up for it to do its thing now. But those four flam rudiments, those are your four accent tap scenarios. So the shtick here is here are three notes. So you have tap, accent, tap. So the first scenario is here. There's upstroke because there's time to lift the stick, downstroke because there's time to stop the stick, and then a tap, three separate elements. Your flam accent does that. And then there's this one. So now there's time to lift the stick, but then you hit the accent. There's not enough time to stop it, so I need to flop. So no chop, flop, and drop. I mean, you don't use your finger chops, just let it flop and drop. It's all finesse. So there's your flam tap. And then this one, now there's no time to lift the stick. So I need to whip it in order to kind of like bump the back end of the stick by throwing the arm down. And that gives you stick height without lifting the stick. So that's your inverted flam tap. And then when they're all together, there's not enough time to lift the stick. So I need to whip it to it. And then there's not enough time to stop it. So you got to whip and flop. So there's your hand to hand flam. All these flam rudiments, it's cute to put them in a little family, but if you could play flam accents, you have no right to think that you can play inverted flam taps, right? They're as different as ice hockey and figure skating. They both take place on ice, but that's as far as you get. So yeah. And then there's the drag and that the one I'm focusing there is your ability to flow into it. So here again, that's cute. We can do that, but can you go, come on in, right? Your ability to flow into that drag, that's going to be a crucial hand motion. And that might be it. So those 12 rudiments, if you can go slow to fast to slow with all of them, you will have covered each individual hand motion to play anything and everything under the sun. And those are all on drum workout dot com with strategic workouts where you play along with me and I coach you and I guide you and the results are astounding. So yeah, so we covered a lot of stuff today. So I really appreciate you having me, Trey. And oh, dude. I hope people check it out and dig it. And yeah, it's, it's good to be here. Some people ask me how, you know, how do I get to where you are doing what you do? And I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, good luck. You know, I wouldn't have believed it if you told me what I ended up doing years ago. But the bottom line is if you just do your best to serve people well, and you know, if 
if it's about me and my glory and look at me, how cool I am, you know, good luck. You know, it's chasing after the wind. You'll forever be unsatisfied. But if you, you know, put others first, create, you know, create products that are going to help them serve them well, then you'll end up, you know, doors will open for you. So it works out. Yeah, it seems like that's worked for you. I mean, just since it's in the frame and I figured I'd ask, was there a quad pad before you made that? Not really. Yeah, yeah. right. The heavy hitter pads, that's a whole other story. A company, the short version, this company was talking to me about doing a signature quad pad and they kind of wanted it to be smaller and they wanted to do one size. Like, no, you know, if, if I'm doing this, I'm going to do it right. So. Yes, it was an opportunity to do a thing and, you know, make a few bucks from it or whatever. It's like, no, it's not right. I'm not going to do it. Sometimes integrity is expensive, but it's worth it in the end. And so I made a prototype to the identical specs of my quads. And then, of course, the rubber drags. So I went and I got old, crusty bass drum heads from an attic of a store down the road and cut them up and glue them on and in the first i think the first thing i played was the 94 cadets quad feature and i was jumping up and down and shouting it's like pounding the kitchen table because i was i was so pumped that it worked and i was so ticked that this thing did not exist when i needed it and so mm. thinner rubber the extra thin of the slim pad the laminates that make everything articulate no laminate on this one but it's like, why haven't people done this? And it's, it's been an incredible success. And, you know, there's endless copies, but there's only one heavy hitter. So pretty cool. Yeah, there's only one heavy hitter and his name is Bill. <laughs> yeah, Chris Roman asking us why you're talking about time. And we, you know, we were just dirt poor, you know, it's just teaching drum lines and just getting started in life in the early 20s or whatever. And he got a tax return of like, want to do this? Well, yeah, let's do it. And so there it goes. That's so awesome. Common sense, pretty much. <laughs> All right. And now one more for you. This is tradition on the show. Since drummers are uh, the rambunctious ones, typically, what is some trouble that you've gotten into in the back of the bedroom? Oh, gosh. We were a force of destruction. We had the typical... I guess wanger or whatever band cart, you know, percussion cart. <laughs> and the thing weighed a ton. And we had a lengthwise, <laughs> this is so bad, a lengthwise drum room. And at the back of it was sort of a metal window panel inserted into the cinder block wall. But it wasn't windows, it was just solid, but it was the construction of the windows. And so don't do this. This is terrible, this is stupid kid stuff. But we loaded the card up with everything. And then someone would start pushing it through the door. And there was just always like, oh, God, oh gosh, you know, like grab the doors, close the doors. And then this thing would ram into the back of the room really, really hard. And it was to the point where that metal frame had been pushed out. Like, I think we were on our way to like, punching out of the building itself. <laughs> Terrible, stupid, don't do it. So but just uh... <laughs> I would like a good idea. <laughs> it was a really, really, really dumb idea. So yeah, don't don't do that. But Classic. at the time, it seemed like a good idea, like many things. Biggest thing is just the amount of fun you have. So I mean, I went to Podunk. Sorry, I went to Podunk High School, and there was not a lot of clues. You know, there was no net to grab the clues back there, but. We had so much fun and, you know, yes, we want the top level. We want excellence and whatnot, but even when you're in the who knows where kind of moderate level, just the camaraderie and people pay money to join fraternities to get friends. Mm -hmm. like, you got the friends. I tell kids at markets who come in there in eighth grade, it's like, congratulations. You just got 25 best friends. So if someone's stuffing you into a locker, these guys are going to show up and have your back. So it's an, you know, the, the only way to succeed is to have each other's back. And it's, it's just a, such a fantastic activity on so many levels. Yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. I hope people dig it and check out more of your podcasts. So I appreciate what you do and keep at it. Well, thanks, man. Thanks. We'll keep in touch, I hope. Yeah, beautiful. I love mm-hmm. that. Maybe come down to Florida, do some more clinics or whatever. I travel all over. I love to do it. So just let me know. Dude, if you're in Florida, come beat up my line. They'll, they'll love it. Yep. Count me in. All right, my man. Take care. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.